Let me just give you all a very warm welcome to Cumber Free Presbyterian Church for our services today. We're delighted to see you. We want to warmly welcome you all in our Saviour's precious name, both upstairs and down, those who have gathered, and of course those that are listening on the World Wide Web, on Sermon Audio, Facebook and YouTube. Uh, we do have quite a number who tune in through those social media platforms, and we're very encouraged to know that you're uh, with us in spirit as well as uh, some who have gathered here in their physical presence. And we're glad to see you all. We warmly welcome you in the Saviour's name. If you're a visitor with us or you're here for the first time, we'd like to warmly welcome you in our Saviour's name. Uh, we do have some folks from Ukraine. We have Lyra and Paul. If you'd just like to stand up, is that okay? And uh, we'll give them a very warm welcome. So thank you for joining with us. Their, their English is as good as my Ukrainian, so uh, uh, they, they'll maybe struggle slightly in the service, but we're delighted to have them with us, and we thank them for, for coming. We do pray for Ukraine and for their country. We pray the Lord would intervene, and even in the morning prayer meeting, uh, there was prayer offered for peace and an end of war in that land. So we're glad to see you all. We warmly welcome you in our Saviour's name. Could I just, before we commence our service, on behalf of our sister Diane Ernie and her husband Brian and uh, Alison and Matthew and Mark, the whole family, uh, just to pass on a sincere word of thanks to the congregation here in Cumber. As you know, Diane now and Brian are back out to church again, and they just want to acknowledge how grateful and thankful they have been uh, from last Christmas Eve uh, till now, and the visitation, uh, the phone calls, the cards, and the sympathy expressed as well during the bereavement of Diane's mother. And your prayers as a congregation, I just want to tell you on the frequent visits that I have with the family, that they really do appreciate everything you've done for them. And they've asked me just to pass on their sincere thanks to this congregation uh, for all that you've been to them and has done for them. There's still ongoing need, and we trust the Lord will perfect that which concerns you, Diane, and give you perfect healing and give you grace and help at this time. Also been asked to say a word of thanks. I think our brother Norman McElroy is at Carrick Fergus today preaching, and he's asked me about four times so that I don't forget to thank those who came uh, for the cleanup uh, around the church and uh, to emphasize just how much it was appreciated. And again, to say to those young people who came and stayed till about 10 o'clock at night working here around the church and how greatly encouraged the folks were that many of those young people were present and uh, we trust the Lord will continue to bless that labor of love for his name's sake. So we trust the Lord will uh, bless those that we've mentioned uh, today. We're going to commence our service proper by singing together the words of uh, number 59. Uh, you'll have a hymn book in front of you or the words will come up on screen. Number 59, Jesus, the very thought of thee.
us just bow briefly before the Lord in prayer. Just like you to please remember our sister Ruth Stewart. That's uh, Ruth, Marcus, and Lucas, usually sit up there in the gallery. Uh, Ruth would be the daughter of Albert Elizabeth Rutherford. Uh, Ruth met with an accident with a chainsaw, and you can just imagine how serious that would be. And she now is awaiting surgery. I'm not sure if she's got the call today. She has, so she's maybe going today for surgery. So you could remember Ruth. I was with her yesterday, and she was waiting maybe two days and still hadn't been called for surgery. And there was a concern for that tendon needs to be uh, put back again, a little spring there in that sheath. And we trust that all will go well, and the Lord will guide the hand of the surgeon, and that uh, the Lord will give perfect healing to that hand. And we trust the Lord will undertake for Marcus and for Lucas, and also for Albert and Elizabeth and Benjamin as well. So we trust the Lord will undertake. My sister Yvonne Spence uh, had a connection uh, with one of the individuals that was killed in that uh, helicopter accident over in the airfield in Newton Ards. And uh, to Yvonne and the family, we are remembering you in prayer and trust the Lord will undertake. Remember those two individuals' families uh, that were killed tragically, and we trust the Lord will draw near and give grace and comfort at this time. Let's just bow briefly before the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, it is with thanksgiving and joy that we enter into thy courts. We stand before thee by blood alone. In the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ, our wonderful Saviour, we thank thee that he is God above. He is God over all. He is, O oh God, we thank thee, the God-man. We rejoice in his, Lord, unique person, two distinct natures in one unique person. He is the mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. We come in his worthy name to worship thee. We thank thee for the cross. We thank thee for Calvary the place where our Redeemer died. We thank thee for that precious blood that was shed, and we rejoice that the Lord Jesus Christ rose from the dead. He's alive forevermore, at thy right hand exalted. And we thank thee, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, thy thrice holy Jehovah God. We bow before thee in the Saviour's name to worship thee, thanking thee for who thou art, the creator of the ends of the earth, the God of all the universe. There's nothing made but was made by thee, and thou art God alone. Beside thee there's no one else. We realize that thou art the true and the living God, and we reject all notions of other gods. We don't believe there are gods many. They're the figment of man's imagination, and Lord, they're the work and creation of their own hands. They're idols, Lord. They have eyes, but they see not. Ears, and they hear not. They have mouths, and they speak not. They have hands and feet, so to speak, Lord. And they walk not, feel not, touch not. And Lord, they have no emotions, but thou art the true and the living God. And we worship thee as God. And we acknowledge thee and the trinity of thy sacred persons. We come to worship, praise, love, and adore thee. We give thee our hearts worship today. We lift our soul and our spirit to thee, and we come with joy, with thanksgiving, with praise upon our hearts. We've been singing about our Savior, and Lord, we love him. We love him with all of our hearts today, and in his worthy, wonderful name, we stand before thee clothed in his righteousness. We thank thee that our sins are forgiven. We have peace with God and it's well with our soul. And Lord, as we approach thee, we do give thee thanks for the temporal blessings of this life, food and clothing, warmth and shelter, health and strength, the use of all our faculties and, Lord, the several abilities bestowed upon us. We thank thee for civil and religious liberty today. We thank, Lord, of the loss of freedom in other countries. Remember the persecuted church today. As commanded, O God, through the writings of Paul in the book of Hebrews, uh, to remember those that are in bonds. And we're not unmindful of the persecuted church, Lord. We would pray, and while some have found the Lord in the furnace of affliction, some may even say they wouldn't want it to stop. And yet, Lord, we know that there are families that are grieved today, hearts that are broken. And we pray, O God, that they may share in the same liberty that we have, the freedom to worship 
the freedom to, Lord, interpret the scripture according to conscience. We ask, O God, you will answer prayer and you will set these lands free again and you'll have mercy, O God, upon those uh, countries that forbid the preaching of the gospel. We think of North Korea, Lord, cut off from the outside world with little or no gospel influence. And we ask, O God, that uh, the door would be opened, that there would be some means, O God, to get the gospel in to the teeming multitudes out of Christ without a saviour. We pray, O God, for the unreached Lord tribes and nations. We pray, O God, it will please thee to bless the endeavour of missionaries who are labouring at the borders and are trying to make contact and establish, O God, that link between those individuals and those who are labouring today to learn their language, Lord, to get it into some printed form or, or even some sign language to communicate the gospel. We ask, O God, you'll prosper their work and give them good success, that multitudes would be reached and hear of Christ, the mighty to save. And for those countries that are blessed, those countries like America and Britain and Europe, uh, Lord, that are blessed with gospel freedom and liberty, that have gospel preaching churches right across their lands and little hamlets and villages and towns and cities, gospel texts, literature, open airs, and so much of the gospel. And yet, Lord, so much rejection in the Western society and world. We cry unto thee for mercy. And we think of our Lord, our entire earth today, Lord, an earth that's given over like in the days of Noah to violence and bloodshed, and as in the days of Lot to sodomy and abortion and euthanasia, we cry unto thee for mercy for the earth. We pray, Lord, that it'll please thee to turn many to righteousness. We pray for Ukraine today. We ask, Lord, for peace in that land. We pray for an end of war. We ask, O oh God, for the preservation of life. No one wins in war. We realize, Lord, there are individuals now in eternity because of war, some in heaven, some in hell. And we cry to thee for mercy, for an intervention of God, that even folks present in this building and this province and elsewhere, Lord, will be able to return again to their land. And we pray for the land to be built up again. Have mercy, we pray. And give help, Lord, from trouble. Remember the sick and sorrowing today. Pray for our sister Ruth. Pray you'll undertake for her. Pray for Yvonne. Pray for that two families that have been bereaved with that helicopter accident. We pray, Lord, for an intervention of God and grace and for comfort for the Capper and Arnold family circles as well and many who still mourn and grieve the loss of a loved one. We commend them lovingly to thee. Remember John and Gemma today, Brian and Pat and Ruth, and we just commend so many to thee. We think of Ken Brown and Philip today. Lord, remember them, John and Martha. Lord, we just pray that you'll remember these individuals, John and Nell Kerr, Billy and Muriel Potter, Lord. We pray for Bobby Moore today and our brother Bobby Gibson. We pray, Lord, for Francis Hunsdale, and we just commend Francis to thee. Pray for our sister Janice, Lord. We remember, Lord, our sister Diane. Pray you'll perfect that which concerns her. Remember Sylvia, Lord. We just pray you'll draw near. Remember our sister Betty Allister and grant that you'll nurse her to full health and strength again. And remember too, Lord, Dr. Nigel Campbell and his wife Caroline. Remember Elizabeth Edwards as they're over in Uganda. We pray, Lord, you'll be with them in the weeks they have left and you'll undertake for them. So we commit all these dear ones to thee and pray for them. And and many more beside. And Father, in answer to prayer, bless the preaching of the word today. Save the lost in this house and elsewhere. Revive thy work. Restore the backslider. Father, glorify thy son. Remember the meetings today in the afternoon in the open air, the gospel service tonight. In all things, we pray that Christ will be uplifted, Christ will be honored, and Christ will be glorified. For we ask these things in his precious and worthy name. And the people of God said, Amen. Let's turn in our Bibles, please, to the book of Numbers, the chapter 6. We've been looking last Lord's Day at the life of Samson, and uh, we've been thinking about uh, the strong man who was robbed of his strength. Uh, we were also thinking about Samson, who was not only the strong man robbed of his strength, uh, but sin was the great robber, and how true that is, sin is the great robber. And uh, so we're going to finish uh, today in our preaching uh, on that little thought, sin, the great robber, or the strong man, Samson, robbed of his strength. And I just want to read some verses from the book of Numbers and the chapter 6. It does no harm for the child of God, the believer, 
uh, when they're reading their Bible. And when you come to passages, maybe especially in the Old Testament, uh, to give yourself a little chapter summary. Now, what I mean by that, I don't mean you memorize the entire chapter, but if you want to do that, then you go ahead. Uh, You go ahead and memorize it. But it's what is known as chapter summaries. I'm sure you've heard God's people, those who are saved, say, when they're witnessing even to their friends or they're in conversation, you know, it says in the Bible somewhere, but they don't know where it is. They haven't a clue. In fact, it may not even say it in the Bible. I think, if I remember rightly, someone said to me one time, and I don't think they were joking, they said to me, does it not say in the Bible if the Lord wanted you to smoke, you'd put a chimney on your head? And I says, well, definitely never read that in the Bible. <laughs> that was in the book of Hezekiah, chapter 146, but it's definitely not there. But, you know, it's good to know your Bible. And one of the best ways for, to understand, recall the Bible in a very simple way is to give what is known as chapter summaries. Now, I'm sure I could say to this congregation, John chapter 3, and you could summarize that chapter for me. You could tell me, yes, it's a conversation with Nicodemus. There's the chapter of the new birth. In many ways, that would be a good summary. John chapter 3, there's the chapter of the new birth and also contains the greatest text in Holy Scripture. You may even even say it references Moses and the serpent in the wilderness. So John chapter 3, you would know if someone said to you, what does it say in the Bible about the Lord's uh, lifted up as the serpent in the wilderness? Oh, that's John chapter 3. And also there it's the conversation with Nicodemus and the greatest text in all of the Bible, John 3, 16. But if someone said, well, what does it say in Numbers chapter 6? There are only two thoughts in Numbers chapter 6. Two simple thoughts. One, the law of the Nazarite. The law of the Nazarite. And two, the ironic blessing. And the Nazarite is simply a Hebrew word which means separated. Nazar. Nazar. Separated. Consecrated. The law of an individual who separates himself unto the law. Unto the Lord. And then, in the last few verses, the blessing of Israel's high priest. Uh, You can, as I would do, I would memorize passages or I would recall passages by using different little thoughts. I could think to myself, well, here you have six people who are consecrating themselves to the Lord and the Lord blesses them. That would summarize number six for me. Number six, six people who consecrate the law of the Nazarite themselves unto the Lord, and the Lord blesses them, the ironic blessing. That's how I would then summarize the chapter. If someone said to me, could you tell me, where is the ironic blessing in the Bible? I would say it right away. Numbers chapter 6, and also in that same chapter, you have the law of the Nazarite. So if you're reading your Bible, here's a good way to summarize an entire chapter. And that is, look at the main points, the, the, the theme that's really dominant. Pick it out. And memorize that. It's very easy to do. And then when someone says to you, where's this in the Bible? Or if you're witnessing, you can say, you know, the Bible gives the ironic blessing of God upon his people in Numbers chapter 6. And then if you want to go further, you can actually memorize the verse. And you'll be able to say Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 to 26. Or you'd say the law of the Nazarite right through from Numbers chapter one, six, chapter 6, verse 1, right through till about chapter or verse 21 or 2. And you would do well if you could summarize and even write a little note at the top of the chapter, those two thoughts. I could write in my Bible now, six people who consecrate themselves to the Lord and receive God's blessing. That would summarize the entire chapter 6. Now, if I was to say to you, What's in John chapter 3, you would tell me. But if I was to say to you, what's in John chapter 7? Or what's in John chapter 4? Or what's in John chapter 2? So it's good that you read your Bible just to help you and encourage you and to give variety to Bible study and to your daily reading is to summarize the chapter you're reading and just to pick out the dominant themes. And that's what we have here in Numbers uh, chapter 6. So we'll take up the reading then at the very first verse. Numbers chapter 6. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When either man or woman shall separate themselves to vow a vow of a Nazarite, to separate themselves unto the Lord, 
He shall separate himself from wine and strong drink, and shall drink no vinegar of wine or vinegar of strong drink. Neither shall he drink any liquor of grapes, nor eat moist grapes or dried, probably raisins. All the days of his separation shall he eat nothing that is made of the vine tree, from the kernels even to the husk. All the days of the vow of his separation, there shall no razor come upon his head, until the days be fulfilled, in the which he separateth himself unto the Lord, he shall be holy, and shall let the locks of his hair of his head grow. All the days that he separateth himself unto the Lord, he shall come at no dead body. I want you to turn over to Judges chapter 16. And this is where we have the Numbers chapter 6 in the life of an individual, Samson. He was a Nazarite unto God. And Delilah is the only woman that he has wrongly associated with and immorally associated with, forbidden by God that is given a name. The other two ladies were not given a name because they didn't bring him down. But this one did, and God names her. And she is the one that brought Samson down and destroyed him. So he's being tempted by Delilah and he's been mocked or she has mocked her three times. And in verse 15 of chapter 16, we read these words. And she said unto him, or Delilah said unto Samson, how canst thou say I love thee when thine heart is not with me? Thou hast mocked me these three times and hast not told me wherein thy great strength lieth. And it came to pass when she pressed him daily with her words and urged him so that his soul was vexed unto death that he told her all his heart and said unto her, There hath not come a razor upon mine head, for I have been a Nazarite unto God from my mother's womb. If I be shaven, then my strength will go from me. And I shall become weak and be like any other man. And when Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called for the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up this once, for he has showed me all his heart. Then came the lords of the Philistines, came up unto her, and brought money in their hand. And she made him sleep upon her knees. And she called for a man, and she caused him to shave off the seven locks of his head. And she began to afflict him, and his strength went from him. And she said, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awoke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times before and shake myself. And he wist not that the Lord was departed from him. But the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with fetters of brass. And he did grind in the prison house. Amen. We'll end our reading there at the verse 21. We know the Lord will indeed bless the public reading from his own precious and infallible word. We're going to ask our clerk of session, Mr. Jackie Allister, please, if he'll come forward. He's going to make some necessary announcements. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It is good to see the church so well filled up. Good to see each individual who has gathered with us. And if you're visiting, then, of course, we want to give you a very special uh, word of welcome. And we do pray that the Lord will bless us all in his presence this morning. Do you remember, (coughs) folks, our own folks, uh, that weather permitting, dry so far, Uh, We'll head out into the open air this afternoon at 3 p.m. The venue this afternoon for that open air meeting is up the Glen Road, uh, and we hold it there at the uh, junction at the corner of Dalton Drive up the Glen Road on the left-hand side. So do keep that in mind, please, this afternoon. Uh, Then this evening, of course, we have our gospel service at 7 p.m. The Reverend Martin will be back with us, God willing. Uh, to bring the gospel in the evening time and do of course remember the season of prayer prior to that over in the church hall at 6 30. 
two meetings during the week to remind you of. Uh, that's our prayer meeting on Tuesday evening at 8 p.m. And then at 10 p.m. on Friday evening, uh, there is the men's prayer meeting. So keep those meetings in mind, please. Next Lord's Day, the services at the usual times, uh, half past 11 uh, as our morning service. Uh, and of course, it's the last Lord's Day of the month. So we'll be gathering around the Lord's table uh, after the morning service next Lord's Day. So keep that in mind as well. Uh, then we've been mentioning the special uh, service in the evening time uh, at 7 p.m. Uh, whenever there will be a parade and there will be a meeting uh, of the apprentice boys uh, here in the church. So do you remember that? Remember it in prayer uh, and do pray it. Uh, goodly numbers will gather in under the sound of the gospel uh, next Lord's Day evening. And of course, in the afternoon, weather permitting, there will be the open air outreach as well. Can I just mention as well, uh, the Loch Earn uh, fundam uh, Fundamentalist Convention, uh, something has been a feature uh, of our denomination now for 40 years. I didn't quite re uh, realize that until I looked at the little leaflet, uh, but uh, that conference is celebrating uh, its 40 years uh, in operation this year. Uh, it takes place, of course, uh, in our uh, Enniskillen uh, congregation, the Bethel Free Presbyterian Church there in Enniskillen. Commences next Lord's Day, uh, and it runs for a full week, full week right through to uh, the Lord, following Lord's Day, the 7th of August. Uh, it uh, takes place uh, both the Sundays and also each weeknight uh, in that week as well. So each, each weeknight at 8 p.m. Uh, during uh, that week commencing, uh, well, the Monday will be uh, the 1st of August and right through to the Friday uh, and the Lord's days as well. So do keep that in mind. Can I mention as well just the missionary boxes for Brother Robert? Thank those who have brought them in, uh, and uh, those will be available. Those, uh, if your name was on the box, I'll get it back to you hopefully today. Uh, if your name wasn't on your bo uh, box, uh, then you'll find the box uh, sitting there in the porch of the church as you leave. Thank you. Well, we do thank our clerk of session for making those announcements, subject as always to the divine will of the Lord. Could I just mention that uh, uh, we will make available, you'll have to pay for it, of course, the British Church newspaper. Uh, it's a fortnightly publication, and it keeps you up on current affairs in the evangelical world. There's some tremendous articles every fortnight in the British Church newspaper. We will have a sheet in the hall for a few weeks. If you would like to sign up for that, uh, it's 1.20 uh, for the fortnightly uh, publication, or if you want the annual subscription, it's uh, £32.50. All the details are there. There's a few copies sitting uh, on the table in the church. I'll put this one here as well. If you'd like to take it away and have a read at it, if you're interested, take it with you. And if you'd like to sign up, we'll just give one opportunity for this. And uh, it certainly is a very, very up-to-date, current affairs little newspaper. And uh, it certainly gives us what's going on in the world and the religious world. And it highlights everything that you need to know in current affairs in the religious, not the political, but in the religious field. The British Church newspaper has been going now for quite a number of years. So please keep that in mind if you'd like to sign up. Let's turn in our hymn books again uh, to the hymn 371. 371, please, my Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine.
Amen. That's good singing. We do appreciate that. So let's turn again in our Bibles to Judges chapter 16. Judges chapter 16, as I mentioned earlier, last Lord's Day, we were thinking about sin, the great robber, and the strong man who was robbed of his strength. You could also add in there the sweet psalmist who was robbed of his song for David and his adultery and murder of Uriah and Bathsheba. Uh, We know that for 11 months he lost his joy. Psalm 51 tells us that he cried, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. And so we were thinking of Samson, and we're going to finish that little uh, thought that we commenced last Lord's Day morning, uh, finishing out these uh, headings and some thoughts on the life of Samson. Loving Father, we thank thee for worship today, for singing, for praise, for prayer. We thank thee for the reading of Holy Scripture. And we lift our hearts in thanksgiving that we worship thee in spirit and in truth. We come through the mediator, the Lord Jesus Christ alone. And as we come now to the hearing of the word of God and to the preaching forth of the message, we pray for help from heaven. Lord, we come to thy throne of grace. It's there we obtain mercy. And what a difference that will make to this meeting, to hearts that have gathered, to homes that are represented, to need that is, Lord, uh, before us and before thee. What a difference if we obtain mercy now from God at the throne of grace. I pray, Lord, that I might obtain mercy to preach, that, Lord, mercy would be given to those who hear, mercy to the unconverted to be saved, mercy to the backslider to be restored, mercy to thy people to be given help through difficult times. Lord, what a difference it will make. We're at the right place just now. At the throne of grace, there we obtain mercy. And, Lord, if that's not all, and there's plenty there, then, Lord, we find grace to help in time of need. And what a difference that's going to make today if we receive grace to help in our time of need. And what a needy time we have. Lord, bless the preaching of the word today, not only here in Cumber, but across our denomination and outside of it. We pray you'll bless the ministry of the word. Remember our brother Norman today as he would preach in Carrick Fergus, encourage him and bless him as he ministers the word morning and evening. And Lord, hear prayer for this place and pour out of thy spirit. Give to me now cleansing through the blood, the infilling of the Holy Spirit of promise. Grant to me that anointing, that endowment of power from on high. And Father, in answer now to prayer, be pleased to glorify thy dear son, the people of God said. Amen. Now, Samson was a Nazarite unto God. Let me just emphasize that. I know last Lord's Day we've touched slightly upon it, but he was a Nazarite unto God. As I said to you, the vow of the Nazarite is found in uh, Numbers chapter 6. And some people would say, well, is the Nazarite the office like the prophet? No, it's not. Well, is it a special office that people are called to? No, it's not. In fact, the law of the Nazarite, any person could actually bind themselves under the law of the Nazarite. In fact, in number six, it says male or female. So it wasn't something that only men did. Uh, You could literally, as an Israelite, uh, take a period of time. Uh, Most people tell us and historians tell us uh, that the law of the Nazarite, some people took it for a month, some took it for a year, some maybe committed themselves to two years, maybe five years, maybe ten. There's some who may have committed themselves to a lifetime under the vow of the Nazarite. Uh, There are only three people in Holy Scripture, only three, that we know of, and you might even say there might be a few more, but there are only three people in the whole of Holy Scripture that from birth they were under the Nazarite vow, and that is Samuel. You remember? And all three births, by the way, were supernatural births. You remember Samuel? Samuel, Hannah was barren. The Lord had shut up her womb. She couldn't have children. And she cried unto God and she made a vow that if the Lord was to give her a man-child, then she would dedicate, that's under the law of number six, the law of the Nazarite, dedicate young Samuel unto the Lord. And from birth, Samuel was a Nazarite unto God, and God called him and gifted him in the office of prophet. And then we come to Samson. And you remember Samson, his mom and dad, they couldn't have children. And then supernaturally, the angel appeared to Manoah. 
and said that his wife would have a child and he couldn't believe it because she was barren. She, she was past bearing, more or less, and she could never have children. But supernaturally, to that family, there was born a young boy and his name was Samson. And the Bible says he would be a Nazarite unto God from his birth. Now, I wonder, I wonder, do you know who the third one is? Did you guess who the third one is? I'd love just to leave it there and just go on, but that would be cruel, wouldn't it? But I think I will. <laughs> no, I'm only jesting. No, the third one is John the Baptist. That's who the third one is. And maybe some of you have guessed it already. John the Baptist was no doubt a Nazarite unto God. And if you read in Luke chapter 1, his father Zacharias was in the temple laboring and he was offering incense at the time of prayer and the angel uh, appeared unto him. And told him that his wife would have a child. And he, he didn't believe because his wife was past bearing. And it was impossible. And we know that. We know that uh, God says in his word. Or the, the very words of Elizabeth and Mary. That with God all things are possible. And John the Baptist was commanded that he was not to take strong drink. And that was the law of the Nazarite from uh, Numbers chapter 6. So there are only three from birth. We do believe. We do believe that if you read in the epistles of Paul, that there were at least two occasions, maybe three, that Paul put himself under the law of the Nazarite. That he bound himself under the law of the Nazarite. And therefore, as a result of that, uh, they say that Paul himself uh, took Numbers chapter 6 and he consecrated and he dedicated and he separated his life under the law of the Nazarite for a certain period of time. And that would have been a time of separation from everything. A time whenever you would consecrate your life full time with nothing else unto the Lord. So it wasn't a vow you made every day. And it wasn't a vow that was for every person. Furthermore, the people tell us that Christ was a Nazarite. And therefore you see the pictures of Christ which we don't believe, I agree with. You see the pictures of Christ and he has the long hair and they say he has the long hair because he's Jesus the Nazarene. Well, that has nothing to do with the law of the Nazarite. We don't believe that Christ was a Nazarite. He wasn't under the Levitical law in Numbers chapter 6. We don't believe that Christ had long hair as they show us in the little children's books and the pictures and the images that people have in their church buildings or in their homes with little candles underneath them. Uh, some people say he had to have long hair because... He was a Nazarite. No, he wasn't. He was a Nazarene, which simply meant that he came from Nazareth. That's all that word means. In fact, the word Nazar is the word separate or consecrate. And that's where you get the Nazarite from the Hebrew word consecrated, separated unto God. But some people would even argue that Samson broke the Nazarite vow when he touched the body of a, a dead animal. And that's true, he did. Do you remember whenever a lion, a young lion, roared against him and came up against him and with his bare hands, he killed that young lion. And then he was passing by a while later and he, he just went aside to see the lion, the carcass of the lion. And inside the carcass was this swarm of bees and they'd made honey and he, he took it with his bare hand and he ate the honey. And then you remember the riddle that he gave to the Philistines? Out of the eater came forth meat and so on and so on. Uh, and then the sweetness of the honey. And then, of course, he was deceived and gave the riddle to that woman. And she told the Philistines. And he said, you plowed with my heifer. That's how you know my riddle. And he went out and killed so many Philistines and paid the debt that he owed to them. And you well remember that people will say, and commentators might even say, that he broke his Nazarite vow. He didn't. He didn't. But you say, well, does not number six tell us that he's not to come upon a dead body because he did lift the jawbone of an ass. That was a dead carcass. That was a bone that was of a dead animal. He wasn't to touch anything that was dead. Well, we believe it wasn't animal. In fact, if you read it, he's not to come onto the dead body of a mother or father or sister or brother. It does not mention animal. It just simply mentions human bodies. He would have been defiled because if he had a broken his Nazarite vow, he would not have been able to take the gates of the city in his bare hands and walk away with them. When he was with Delilah, he couldn't have taken the beam that was attached to the very web of his seven locks as they were joined together with a pin or fastened to the beam with a nail if he had broken the Nazarite vow. The only time he lost his strength, whenever he cut his hair, when that hair was cut, that was the public symbol of his separation to God. That was the outward symbol of his consecration to the Lord. And if that was touched publicly, 
Samson's strength would go from him. I don't believe, and I've seen pictures even recently, of Samson, and he's so muscular. That wasn't the source or secret of his strength. It was his hair. His hair was the very symbol. And the secret of his strength was the filling of the Holy Ghost. For the Holy Ghost came upon him and gave him supernatural power. Power that no human being who ever worked out in a gym or was on a a daily diet of steroids as they have today could ever achieve. He not only was the strongest man in his day, but the strongest man that will ever exist in the history of the world. He had supernatural strength given by the Spirit of God. And the outward symbol, the public display of his separation to God was his long hair or the seven locks of his hair. We looked last Lord's Day then in the light of Samson the Nazarite unto God uh, concerning his consecration that was demanded of him. He was separated unto the Lord. No strong drink, no dead body, no cutting of the hair. This was a symbol of your separation for life unto the Lord. And when that public symbol disappears, you'll lose your strength and you'll lose out with God. We thought, secondly, of the company chosen by him. Uh, Three women at least that he was with, two of them unnamed, one named Delilah. And then the other company they kept in parties were the Philistines. And we did say that uh, the child of God should not be keeping company regular. We can make friends. We can work with them. We can socialize with them. We can play sport with them. But we should not be joining in association and long-term friendships and running to their places with them. That is not God's will for the child of God. We're separated unto the Lord. And one of the public signs of that separation is that we don't run with the ungodly crowd. And how we see it today, especially among our young people, when they get into the wrong crowd at school, and they get into the wrong company at university, or even in the workplace, and we have heard of individuals who have got into the wrong company, and they're going astray, and their company is leading them away from the Lord. And therefore we need to be careful. So as we finish off these thoughts in Samson, I only only think of the consecration demanded of him and the company chosen by him. But I want you to think of the coldness that was displayed in him. Look with me at Judges chapter 16 and notice the verse 4 and how specific it is in chapter 16 of Judges and the verse 4. And it came to pass afterward, after all that he had done sinfully, wrongly, that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorak whose name was Delilah. Notice the words, he loved. And that doesn't mean that he just liked her and lusted after her. That certainly is the case. But this has reference to do with his separation unto God. He loved her more than keeping his Nazarite vow. He loved her more than being separated unto Jehovah his God. He loved her more than being consecrated to the work and service of God. You see, Samson was a judge. He was a deliverer from the enemy. But what was he doing? He was lying in the lap of the enemy. Delilah. Now we're not saying that, we can't say for sure that Delilah was a Philistine. Sorak, it had Jews as well as Philistines. It was one of those areas. But we believe that because she was so friendly with the actual lords of the Philistines, that she was a Philistine. She was a Philistine. She certainly wasn't a Jew, and if she was, she was a traitor to her nation and to her people. But we believe that she was a Philistine, and it was his love for the enemy, and lying in their lap that destroyed and brought him down, and the coldness that was displayed in him. He loved. Samson had grown cold in his walk with the Lord. He was at a distance from the Savior. In other words, something had stolen his affections. Something had taken his heart away from following the Lord and being separated and consecrated unto God. In many ways, in in Christ, the the Nazarite vow is upon us all who are saved by grace because we're separated unto God. Did Paul himself not say that he was separated unto the gospel of God? And we are consecrated, that is, we're set apart. The word saint, by the way, the Roman Catholic Church take that word and like many words of scripture, they misuse it and abuse it. But biblically, 
you and I who were saved by grace and born of God's Spirit, washed in the Savior's blood, we're saints. Now we know that we think as a saint somebody's perfect. They say he's a saint and she's a saint. But that's not the case. The word saint in Scripture in the Greek is simply set apart for holy use. That's all that word means. In its simple form, Every child of God is a saint. And Paul, writing to some of the churches in the New Testament, says, unto the saints, called, separated, set apart for holy use. In many ways, we're all still under the vow of the Nazarite, separated unto God, consecrated, set apart from all others for a specific work, a holy work, the service of Christ, the worship of God. So Samson had grown cold in his love for the Lord. Something had taken his affections and stolen away his heart. And it was the love of another woman, a Philistine. He enjoyed the company of the Philistines. We find him at times partying with the Philistines. His mum and dad even said to him, Is there not a woman among thine own brethren, thine own kith and kin, that you could seek company with? Why do you have to go down and it's always down. For that was the direction spiritually he was going. He went down to Gaza. He went down to all these places. Why do you have to go down there? To mix with those people that is forbidden in Scripture. And Samson, you're a Nazarite. And you know it. Look at yourself. You can see your hair. You've never cut it to this day. And you're separated unto God. You've neither touched strong drink nor wine. Nor even the husk or the kernel. And we have made sure we have kept the vow under God. And you've never touched the body of a human being that was dead. Not even your relatives when they died. You didn't embrace them with your tears. Or lift them as a dead body. And cried over them and kissed them. You never even touched them. And if mom and dad was to die, you would have kept your Nazarite vow and you wouldn't even have hugged your mother as a dead person and kissed her on the forehead to say farewell for you're a Nazarite unto God and your hair, Samson, is the public display. Now why are you going down to Gaza? Why are you going into the valley of Sorak? You're going away from the Lord and his mom and dad pleaded with him. I don't know, maybe there's a mum and dad that's pleading with you as a young person. Why are you going to that place? Why are you running with that company? Why are you doing it? Why are you there when you should not be there? And if you profess to know the Lord, then you're separated unto him. You're consecrated to God. You're set apart for specific and holy use the worship of God and the glad service of the Savior. His heart was at a distance from the Lord. His love for a Philistine woman and women and other things had taken the place of Christ in his life. This is the third time in Scripture that we read of Samson pursuing an unholy woman. Two of them are unnamed but the third is named because she was the one that brought him down. It was Delilah in the valley of Sorak that ended the very life of Samson and brought him down to terrible suffering, shame and ignominy before his enemies. God called him to be victorious and a deliverer of his people from the Philistines. And the Philistines had him chained to an old grinding mill and then on occasions they brought him out that they might have sport with him. Show us some of your strength, Samson. Go and lift that boulder there. Lift that big rock. Right, there's a plank there. There's a piece of wood. Let's get 40 people on each end. Lift it up, Samson. Show us your strength. They were laughing at him. Where's your strength now? Look at him. He can't even find his way. And they all laughed and mocked. Look at him. And he's leaning against those pillars. And look, there's a little child has to lead him. And they mocked and they laughed. Now God never intended his child to be in that place. But that's where sin brought him. I told you, sin's a great robber. Sin is a great robber. The coldness that was displayed in him. I want to tell you, love for strange women has replaced his love for the Lord. Love for Jesus Christ, and you would agree, is the principal thing. 
And if you say to me, well, I want you to ask me a question spiritually today. I want you to ask me a simple question. I want you to challenge me in a question today. And I want you to ask me a question that will change my life, uh, that will make me think, and that will convict me. I want you to ask me a question now. Well, I would take the words of Christ and I'd let him ask you. And let him ask me the question. Let me, uh, metaphorically, just step out of the pulpit now. Just take a seat with you and sit alongside you. And let the Savior come to this pulpit and stand in all his glorious person and speak as the mediator between God and men and as your Savior and mine. And there's only one question, I'm telling you, there's only one question the Lord would ever ask of you and me today, and it's this. Because everything else will fall into place if we have this. The question that he asked Simon Peter, lovest thou me? Lovest thou me? Now what a question. Lovest thou me? Now I want you to take that question from Christ today and I want you to apply it to yourself. Not to someone else. Not to a young person, not to someone going astray, not to someone who once walked with the Lord, but young person, older person, this preacher, I want us all now to listen to the words of Christ. Love us, thou me. Do you love Christ today? You know, it's a personal question. Love us, thou me. He's not asking someone beside you. He's not asking that person who's always failing and falling and always seems to have besetting sins and always seems to come out on the wrong side of the matter spiritually. No, he's saying to you, lovest thou? Do you love me? That's what the Lord's saying today. The same question was asked of Samson in his day. Do you love me or do you love the Philistines? Do you love your sin and your pleasure and your lust and these women and these Philistines and that party atmosphere? Is that what you love more than me? Is that more to you than me? Love us thy me. It is a personal question. You and I will put our names in there today. It's a question the blessed Lord Jesus Christ and our Savior and my Lord and my God asks me today. Love us thy me. I wonder how you can answer it. Can you answer like Peter? Yeah, Lord, thou knowest. You know my heart. You know, Lord, even though I'm not perfect. Even though at times, I know at times, my love is not what it should be for you. Deep down in my heart, Lord, you know that I love thee. But Lord, maybe we need to pray this today. I do. Lord, inflame that love. It's there. Lord, thou knowest I love thee. Did, did you tell the Lord today? that you love him, did you? Did you tell the Lord today that you love him? I could even say, did you tell your wife today that you love her? Did you tell your husband today you love him? I'm not going to cause any rows in the afternoon, by the way. I don't want to spoil your Sunday lunch. My wife's present here. I don't think there's ever a day that I don't tell her that. Do you love me? No, sorry, I mean, I love you. And when she looks at me, she thinks of the word handsome. Handsome money over, handsome more money over. Uh, my son's getting married here in a week and a half's time, and I said, son, whenever you get married, you'll have sinus problems. And he says, the wife will be saying to you, sign us a check, sign us another check, sign us another check. But you know, Love for your wife, for your husband is a wonderful thing. And it's nice to tell someone that you love them. It's nice to tell your children, to give them a hug today, to give them a kiss on the cheek or on the forehead and say, do you know I love you? Do you know that I love you? It's a wonderful thing to be loved, isn't it? And it's a wonderful thing to be told that someone loves you. But what about the Lord? I'm not saying the Lord needs our sympathy. He does not. No, no way does the Lord need our sympathy. But I wonder, did you tell the Lord that you loved him today? It was a searching question. It probes into the depths of our hearts, doesn't it? It's a grievous question. Because when the Lord says, love us thou me, as the Lord questioning our love, it may grieve us today, Lord. It did, Peter. For it says, Peter was grieved that the Lord asked him the third time, love us thou me. And you know, it's a repeated question three times the Lord asked Peter. And I do believe the Lord would ask that question every day. When you get up in the morning, when you lay your head in the pillow at night, the Lord would ask you that question, love us thy me. If you were to take that question every day of your life and then just take it from the Lord and, and just use it as the Lord speaking to you, love us thy me, and then respond to it. 
Show that you love him by the way you live, the things you do and the things you don't do. And you know, it's a demanding question. You can't pass it on to someone else. The Lord's saying, love us, thy me. It, it has to be answered. You can't ignore it. It can't be literally passed over. It demands an answer now, love us, thy me. I trust we'll be able to say, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. Now remember, our love for the Lord Jesus Christ, just like the love of Samson for the Lord, that love can be compromised. Samson loved a woman in the valley of Sorak. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, with all thy mind. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God. Isn't that right? The Lord thy God. You're to love him with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. Love him. But I want to tell you, sometimes our love can be compromised. Samson compromised in his love for the Lord. And look what happened to him. You know, our love for the Lord can become cold. I don't know. Maybe that's how you are today. I do not know your spiritual state, but I know this. Do you know that a whole church, that a whole congregation could be out of love for the Lord? In fact, they could be doing gospel missions. They could have all the services. They could have the prayer times before the service. They could have an open air in the afternoon. They could have a gospel evening. They could even have fellowship afterward. They could have meeting after meeting after meeting and youth meeting, children's meetings. And they can have prayer and toddlers. They can be the busiest church. They can be orthodox. They can be evangelical. Their theology sound. They can dot every single I and stroke every T. As far as orthodoxy is concerned, they can be conservative and they can be separated unto the Lord. And listen, and in... On paper, they are scripturally, doctrinally, sound and ecclesiastically separated from apostasy. And yet, an entire congregation could be out of love for the Lord. How do you know that? Well, did you read it in the book of the Revelation, chapter 2? The church at Ephesus, a whole congregation, it was said of an entire body of God's people, Thou hast left first love. That's an amazing thing because you would imagine an individual's guilty of that. Not a whole congregation. But it's true. You know what the Bible says? One of the marks of the end time. One of the marks of the last of the last days. One of the signs that we know the Lord's return is close. You have to look among the, the, God's people, the church. And it says this, The love of many shall wax cold. We should not, as a pastor, or as those who are students of the word, we should not be surprised to see that many of God's people are lukewarm. They're apathetic. They can take a meeting or leave it. They can take a daily quiet time or leave it. They can read their Bible or just never bother. They could pray, but wait them in trouble. They could be lukewarm, apathetic. The love of many, because iniquity will abound. Sodomites walking our streets, parading their sin. Shame on them. Abortion clinics open to murder children. Hundreds of children were murdered in Northern Ireland. I want to tell you something. We would condemn that if people were burning their children to Molak in the fire. But this is child sacrifice. Sacrificing their children because they couldn't be bothered looking after them. Because they had a, a night out drinking. The consequences of relationships is the birth of this child. And I wouldn't be up to having it because I want the party and I don't want the burden. So let's abort it. Let's do away with it. And if there's something wrong with it, let's do away with it. And you know, it's sad, but it's true. And because such iniquity is abounding, the love of many is waxing cold. The love for Christ and our fellow man. You know, our love can be conditional. I asked my eldest boy, I'll never forget it to the day that I die. He came to me, and when he comes, and all my children are very good at pleading their case and their cause to me and to their mother. We're the two softest individuals on earth. And they come to us, and my eldest boy came to me one time, and he wanted something, but he wanted it badly, and I knew it. And he says to me, Daddy, can I have? And I looked at him, and I was about to say, of course you can, because I know the joy it brings him. But I did something. I'm not cruel, by the way. <laughs> I says, well, tell me this. If I get this for you, buy this for you, and give it to you, will you love me? And here's what he says. I would, Daddy. I'd really love you. I says, well, tell me this. If I didn't do it, <laughs> would you love me? 
And I'm not joking, there was like a knife in the heart. There was silence. And there was sadness. And you could see his little head down because he wanted this. But to match that with love for his dad, how unfair and unkind you are as a parent. And then the head came up. And in a tearful eye, he said, Dad, if you didn't give it to me, I'd still love you. I says, that's good, son. You're not getting it. No, I didn't. No, I did not. How dare you? <laughs> I says, of course, son. Of course, son, you can have it. And the joy in his face and the joy in my heart that even if I didn't give it to him, he'd still love me. You see, our love can be conditional, can't it? If the Lord blesses me, oh, I love him. If he answers my prayer... Praise him. I love you, Lord. Lord, I'm after this job. You know what means so much to me. And it would make a difference in our home. Lord, if I could get that job, please, Lord. And you get the job. Lord, I love you. Thank you, Lord. But then you don't get it. And then you get sacked from the other job. Because you were looking this other one. Would you say, Lord, I still love you? Our love can be conditional. Now, I have another two points, and I'm not going to get to them. Why do I do this? <laughs> it's the way it happens. I'll have to finish it next Lord's Day. You said, you're bluffing. I have the two points in front of me. I could preach them here till half past one. And there's quite a lot of content in them. I'll return again to it. But you know, just to re-emphasize as we close, love for the Lord Jesus Christ can be a challenge to others. Not only can our love grow cold and be compromised, not only can our love be conditional, but our love for Jesus Christ can be a challenge to other people. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples when ye have love, and on this occasion, for one another. And if you love me, keep my commandments. And when you're keeping God's commandments, you're showing love to Jesus Christ. Wouldn't it be a wonderful thing if someone said to you, No, you just love the Lord, don't you? I don't even know the Lord. I don't even believe in God, but... You love this God that you serve. You love the, this Christ who came in historically to this world and died on a cross and you love him. I can see it in your life. The things you do and the things you don't do. You go to church, you pray, you read your Bible. I see you at lunchtime and in your car you're reading your Bible and then you're witnessing to us and you're good to us and I can just see it in you. You love the Lord and I want to tell you this. I have been in the company of people and I have seen their love for the Lord and it has been a rebuke to me, a real rebuke to me. And these are not ministers or pastors and elders and deacons and they're not those who are on the mission field. I'm talking about the ordinary five-eighths as we call it. The ordinary Christian. And you can see their love for the Lord. It's there. And how often on visitation. I've entered into the homes of people in this congregation. And I've sat with them. Gone to minister to them. Thinking they're down. And I've seen just how much they love the Lord. And how they're in touch with him. And I tell you the truth. I come away guilty. Feeling backslidden. And say Lord. That's how we ought to live. There they are and they haven't much in life. They have no health. They can't get out. They're stuck in that old house. Well, it's not an old house. You know what I mean? They're stuck. Can't get out. And yet, Lord, they're content. And all they do is talk about the Lord. And they just know you, Lord, and they love you. And I feel rebuked. I really do feel that I'm nowhere with God when I think of them. And they're way up there. And I'm away down here. And you know, your love for Christ can challenge others, inspire and encourage your fellow believer, and even the unconverted, even the unconverted. God willing, next Lord's Day, we will consider the calamities that were visited upon him. And then we will, dis we will consider the cry that came from him and how he was restored. And I want you to show you next Lord's Day one of my favorite verses in all of Holy Scripture. Let's bow briefly in prayer. Father, do bless now the ministry of thy word to all of our hearts. Encourage us as we leave the house and as we would sing a few verses in leaving, just grant to us thy sweet and blessed and hallowed presence, for we ask these things now in the Savior's precious and most worthy name. Amen. 417 in closing, please. 417 in closing,
Uh, we probably sing all of the hymn because it's only a few verses and not too many lines. 417, oh teach me more of thy blessed ways, thy holy Lamb of God. Now may the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest and remain upon the Israel of God, both now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>